Hello, I'm Nikki Going. I will be leading you through 10 sessions, a wild ride through Arthur Miller's The Crucible. I hope that you enjoy it. Today, we are going to be discussing an introductory session on The Crucible, where I will give you a lot of background information on the Puritans and try and explain some of the reasons why the witchcraft trials in Salem happened. That will be followed by um, another nine sessions, and this is the way that they'll be structured. So today's session, session one, will deal with introduction and background to the crucible. Session two, the next session, will be on the introduction and the background again, a continuation. Session three will deal with act one. Session four will be the second half of act one. Session five will be on act two. Sessions six and seven will be on act three which is a long act, so it's split into two halves. Session 8 will be on Act 4. Session 9 will be on how to write essays on the Crucible. And Session 10 will be on how to answer contextual questions on the Crucible. So bear the structure in mind, because you can always replay or go back to a session if you want further information, or you want to go through things more slowly. Uh, alternatively, if I'm telling you things that you already know, you can fast forward and skip ahead. So the structure of today's session. I'm going to start off by giving you a very basic outline of the plot. Then I will tell you about how the Crucible is a tale of, in fact, more than one trial. We think that the Crucible is just about the witchcraft trials in the 1600s, but in fact, it deals with the concept of putting people on trial in more than one setting and more than one time. I will talk to you about how the Puritan's history led to the tragedy of the Salem witchcraft trials, the physical and psychological setting of the play, Puritan attitudes towards evil, their attitudes towards children, their attitudes towards women, and their attitudes towards witches and witchcraft. I will then tell you about the structure of the play itself and how Miller broke it down into uh, various themes and acts. And I will talk to you about the degree of historical accuracy with which Miller wrote. Finally, I will talk to you about power and reputation and the impact of these two very, very important concepts and forces on the action of the play. In the next session, I will give you an overview of the characters I will give you an insight into various ways in which you can read and deconstruct the play. I will talk to you about why the Crucible was relevant in the 1950s and very importantly why it is still relevant today. And I will give you some things to think about as you read and as you listen to the next six presentations where we methodically unpack each act. So the plot of The Crucible um, is a really important part, place to start. And as you, as you will see as I run through these presentations, whenever I come across technical terms, I will give you a quick definition just to remind you. And remember that it's really important that you know and understand your definitions when you go into your exams. Um, these are your toolkit, and if you don't know your technical terms, it's very, very difficult to do well in any language and particularly in literature. So plot is the main events in a play, novel or film, and the events are carefully related to each other to form a meaningful story. So much of what happens in your life is simply a series of events. The fact that you stood on the cat doesn't have a deeper meaning. But if you were writing a novel, a film or a play, the fact that you stood on the cat, if you're a good author, would actually have a deeper meaning for the character. It would imply something about their future and the outcomes that are to follow. So remember that all the events in a play, novel or, or film are very deliberately put in, into the story by the author and uh, that they all have a part to play in creating meaning and they're all linked to the themes. So the setting, this is a place and time and type of surroundings where the plot of a play, novel or film takes place. And setting is enormously important because it has a major impact on the events, which is the plot of the, of the play, novel or, or film, 
and it also has an impact on the motivations of the characters. Um, that is to say that the reason the characters do things is often because of the setting in which they find themselves. And then character is simply the literary term for a person in a play, novel or film. So the basic plot of The Crucible, it's based on historical reality and um, what I'm going to unpack for you is where and how it mirrors that historical reality. So in 1692, in a tiny little village in Salem, in the state of Massachusetts, in what is now known as the United States of America, a slave woman called Tichiba and a group of girls aged between 9 and 19 started accusing their neighbors of being witches. This resulted in witchcraft trials being held, and these witchcraft trials soon spiraled out of control. As you read The Crucible, you'll realize that the entire play is based on a very short six-month period where girls went from being utterly powerless to having over 200 people arrested and several of them hanged. In the real Salem witchcraft trials, the evidence given by Tichiba and the girls was largely believed, as it is in Miller's play, The Crucible. In history, over 200 people were falsely accused, 19 were hanged, and 4 died in prison. Again, Miller parallels this history quite closely. So Miller's play, The Crucible, as you can see, is largely based on these historical events. But bear in mind that he did change many aspects. His aim was not so much to retell history as to comment on it, and also to make us think about history so that we don't repeat the same mistakes in our present and our future. So The Crucible, as I said, is actually a tale of more than one trial. Most obviously, and most literally, it deals with the Salem Witchcraft Trials, which took place in 1692. But it is also a satirical allegory for the McCarthy Witch Hunts, or trials that took place in the United States of America in the 1950s. And it can be seen as a satirical allegory for people's ability to turn on members of their own communities and use false accusations in an organized witch hunt to persecute them. And I'm sure you can think of many examples of this happening. Um, often, sadly, in a school environment, think about how a group of people will decide that one person is the other. One person must be ostracized and picked on. And then they will start making allegations and accusations, many of them false, in order to blacken their reputation and that person will lose all power and all standing and all status in the school community and they will be ostracized. Um, it's relatively unlikely that they'll be hanged or put to death as a result of this, but they will probably suffer a, re a, a form of severe social suffering and perhaps even emotional and spiritual damage. So just to remind you what an allegory is, because remember that this play is an extended allegory, um, so it's important that you understand the term. So an allegory is a story where the characters and events make a comment about real world people and events. And in fact, in The Crucible, the story of the Salem witchcraft trials parallels and mirrors and echoes the trials that were happening in McCarthy's America in the 1950s. A satire is the use of techniques by an author like mo humor, mockery, irony, sarcasm, um, and they can also use things like imagery, metaphors, similes, personification. All of these language techniques are used to criticize social institutions and or political processes. So what you will see in The Crucible is that Miller uses satire to criticize government, to criticize paranoia about various ideologies, and to criticize the operations of an unjust and corrupt court. So I'm going to start by unpacking the Pilgrim and Puritan story, which starts off with the Protestant Reformation. And um, 
please note you don't have to know the story for exams because you're going to go into a literature exam rather than a history exam. But this story is very useful background information because it helps you to understand the play. If you can understand where the Puritans came from, you can understand the motivations of the characters and hopefully have some insight into why they did what they did. Uh, this information will also be useful for you when you write essays. So the Puritans were Protestants. Now, if you are a Christian of any um, church, apart from the Roman Catholic Church, you are a Protestant. Uh, this may come as, news, come as news to you, but you're a Protestant. And your religious tradition goes right back to the 1500s. Because in 1517, people started protesting against the Roman Catholic Church. And those protests were the start of the Protestant or Protestant Reformation in Europe. And that Protestant Reformation, which was an, uh, an attempt to reform or change the way that the Catholic Church operated, ran from 1517 to 1648. So the Protestants saw the Catholic Church of the time as incredibly corrupt. And they saw the Catholic Church doing things like actually making people pay for confessions so that they could get forgiveness from their sins. They saw people in the Catholic Church doing things like having multiple sexual relationships and lots of illegitimate children, um, having wild parties and orgies, uh, getting incredibly rich from the money that they collected from the poor. And they saw this naturally and understandably as incredibly corrupt and not in keeping with the teachings of Christ. They also disagreed with the idea that the Pope had the right to make and interpret divine laws. Also probably because there were a number of popes that were very, very corrupt. Um, I must just say here that not every priest and pope within the Catholic Church was corrupt, but uh, there were enough corrupt priests and bishops and popes within the church to make people really object to the way that the church operated and to start off that Protestant Reformation. So the Protestants thought that all law should come from a very strict interpretation of the Bible and that no human being had a right to add to or um, further interpret those laws. They were incredibly anti-materialistic probably because they'd seen how materialism had led to corruption within the Catholic Church. So they wanted all paintings, sculptures, gold, and other evidence of worldly wealth to be removed from the churches. And during the period of 1500 to 1600, they actually went on a number of raids of Catholic churches where they smashed sculptures and they burnt paintings and they melted down all the gold uh, candlesticks and the various um, equipment that was used in Catholic ceremonies. So the Protestants, when they couldn't reform the Catholic Church, they started their own new churches. In England, they started what was called the Anglican Church, which was naturally also known as the Church of England. And in Europe, they started what was known as the Calvinist Churches. And the Calvinist Churches were named after the Protestant reformer John Calvin. In England, some Protestants thought that the Anglican Church was still too Catholic, even though it was a Protestant church and was born out of the Reformation. So what followed was the development of a separate sect of Protestants known as the Separatists. And the Separatists were named after the fact that they wanted to separate from the Anglican Church. There were other Protestants that didn't want to separate from the Anglican Church. Instead, they wanted to purify it of all Catholicism, and they were known as the Puritans. And of course, those are the Puritans that we come to know and perhaps love as we read through the Crucible. In 1603, King James I came into power in England, and he banned all private church services and made worshipping anywhere except in an Anglican church a crime. So the separatists reacted uh, to this by deciding that they needed to actually leave the country. So by 1607, they had immigrated to Holland because in Holland they were allowed to practice their faith in complete peace. <music>
but they then moved to the USA. And this was because having settled in Holland, they only actually stayed there for about 10 years. And then they decided that they didn't particularly like Holland either. And they wanted to set up their very own colony in the, in the newly colonized United States of America. Because they thought if they had their own colony, they would be able to govern themselves and their religious traditions would never be under threat again. So in September of 1602, they boarded a ship called the Mayflower and they sailed from Holland to Plymouth in England and from there they set sail for Virginia in the United States. They weren't particularly good sailors because their ship landed far further north than they had expected. It landed on the east coast of the United States in a place called Cape Cod. And instead of sailing south to Virginia, they looked around, they realized that as far as they were concerned, the land was unpopulated. It wasn't because the Native American Indians already lived there and had lived there for thousands of years. But they decided they were going to start their own colony and run their own government. So the first thing they did was they drew up a document that outlined their plans for their new government. And that document was called the Mayflower Compact. Um, and it was the first document to outline a democratic government in a European colony. Um, note that their idea of democracy would not really correlate with what we understand democracy to be today, but they saw themselves as being very democratic. Um, the Pilgrims government was actually what we would today consider to be an autocratic theocracy. And these are quite important terms, so I'm just going to give you a definition. Learn them and remember them and see if you can use them in your essays. Um, so once they had set up their government, they settled, as I said, in Plymouth. And they named their new uh, settlement of Plym Plymouth after that English town that they'd set sail for the USA from when they set off for Virginia. So here's a painting of their, very, their arrival in uh, Plymouth. And it's called Landing of the Pilgrims at Plymouth on the 11th of December, 1620. And you can see that they didn't plan this very well because they landed in winter and conditions were extremely harsh. And of course, you can see that figure on the bottom left hand side, the Native American Indians. Ironically, the Native American Indians were the reason that these people first survived. But later they turned on them and um, that started the following 400 years of fighting and persecution of the Native American Indians. And um, many of them actually died in the process of the colonization of the USA. So a quick reminder of terms. Democracy is government by and for the people. Autocracy comes from auto meaning self. Um, it's absolute rule. So no one was allowed to question the rule by one person or a small group. So autocracy means that there's a very small group or a single person who ma makes all the rules and administers justice. Theocracy, theos means God. So theos is technically speaking government by God. And the way that this translates into human reality is the church governs the state and the church and the state are inseparable. So the Puritans and the Pilgrims believed that God ultimately governed them through his laws in the Bible, and that the role of the church, which was inseparable from the role of the court, was to implement and interpret those laws. So the Puritan story, okay, they then moved to the USA. As I said, the separatists landed, and these, these were separatists that were known as the Pilgrims, landed in November at the start of a very harsh Massachusetts winter. And of course, they had settled far further north than Virginia, which was relatively much warmer. So half of them died of cold and or starvation before their first spring. As I said, not very good planning. The Native American Indians helped them to actually survive. So one of the things that they taught them to do was they taught them how to grow corn and other crops because although the um, Pilgrim separatists had brought crops over from England, these crops weren't adapted to Massachusetts or the USA, so most of them died. 
And one of the things the Native American Indians taught them how to do was to catch tiny little fish in the bay and then to actually bury them in the soil to fertilize the soil so that they could grow corn or what we call mealies. The pilgrims that survived their first year in Massachusetts held a huge feast which they called a thanksgiving in the autumn of 1621. And the purpose of that feast was to give thanks to God and to celebrate their survival in their new colony. And of course, today, Americans still celebrate Thanksgiving. And they do so by eating many of the same dishes that those original pilgrim separatists ate. So, for example, they'll sit down and they'll tuck into pumpkin pie, corn, turkey with cranberry sauce and um, other similar dishes. Then in 1629, the Puritans, who had remained in England, were allowed by King Charles I to start a new colony in Massachusetts. So they set sail to join the pilgrim uh, separatists who were very closely allied to them in religion in Massachusetts. And the reason that the Puritans left England was because they were unhappy with what they saw as the lack of purity in the Anglican Church in England. So they set sail for the Plymouth Colony in approximately 1630. So it wasn't long after the, those Pilgrim Fathers had settled in Massachusetts. They set up their own colony slightly to the north of Plymouth and they called it Salem. And they also governed themselves using a system of autocratic theocracy. So in other words, a small group of people made all the decisions and they considered themselves to be governed by God through his holy church and the church and the state were inseparable. So he has a painting of that first Thanksgiving and you can see that at this stage they were still working very well with the Native American Indians but sadly that didn't last. They actually invited them to that very first feast. He has a map just to show you where they settled. So in the top right hand corner you can see a map of the USA. You can see that all of the action in the play happens on the east coast and Salem is slightly to the north of Plymouth. The Puritans settled in Salem, the Pilgrims settled in Plymouth. Now what you must remember was that apart from this narrow strip of land on the east coast of the USA, Europeans had not colonized or explored most of the USA. So for them, most of the USA was a land that was completely unknown and was completely inhabited by people who did not worship God and extremely dangerous and probably what they regarded as the devil's fortress. Which brings us to the physical and psychological setting of the play, which is enormously important to understand so that you can understand why the characters in the play did what they did. So here's another painting of that first Thanksgiving. And you can see how very religious these people were and also from this painting how dependent and interdependent they were on the land. So why is this backstory, this history of the Pilgrims and the Puritans important? Remember that past has a big impact on how people deal with their present and the kind of future that they create. Everything that the Puritans did was informed by their memories of the past. And the memory, their memories of the past were largely memories of persecution and suffering and having to go into hiding and exile because of their religion. Miller explores the reasons for the witchcraft trials in his play and the physical and psychological setting, as I said, that the Puritans lived in impacted on all of their decisions. It was why they behaved in the way that they did. Miller also explores the reasons for the McCarthy trials in the USA of the 1950s and he argues, particularly in his notes on the play, that the physical and psychological setting in America at the time made the McCarthy trials possible as well. So he's very interested in psychology and why people do what they do. And of course, we should ask ourselves if the physical and psychological setting in our own country and our own time makes literal, you know, real life witch hunts and figurative figu uh, witch hunts and witchcraft accusations possible or even likely. So let's start with what life was like in Massachusetts for the Puritans. 
Okay, remember they were a very close-knit community because just surviving was an everyday struggle. And Miller actually says, probably more than their creed, which is their religious beliefs, hard work kept the, the morals of the place from spoiling, for the people were forced to fight the land like heroes for every grain of corn, and no man had very much time for fooling around. So they constantly felt their survival to be threatened. They lived very simple and non-materialistic lives. They lived in simple wooden houses. They relied on their crops, their livestock, and their hunting for food. And they were constantly aware that just one uh, epidemic of illness, a single drought or a flood, could literally wipe out their entire community. They didn't have our scientific explanations for most illnesses or natural disasters. And so when these things happened to them, they explained anything and everything they didn't understand in terms of supernatural forces of good and evil. And you can see how this belief system, this attitude towards good and bad fortune actually set them up for believing the witchcraft accusations and for the witchcraft trials. So if good things happened to people, they tended to interpret those good things as God rewarding them for having lived a good life. When bad things happened, such as when Betty Paris started having fits and behaving strangely, they often saw this as evidence of the devil attacking them or of witchcraft. They believed that if they worked hard, God would reward them with a comfortable, secure lifestyle. Notice, not a rich lifestyle because they weren't materialistic, but this was the beginning of the American concept of the American dream. And you can still see that concept of the American dream when you watch American television today. Only the American dream as interpreted today through the lens of capitalism has become a bit distorted. So nowadays, the thinking tends to be that if you work hard, you will be rewarded not only with a comfortable and secure lifestyle, but with great riches. And we still see that the impact of that attitude in South Africa, we often have a tendency to think that when people are poor, when they are suffering socio and economic hardship, it must be because of something they've done. They're inherently sinful. We tend to think that it's because they were lazy and that if they actually just pulled themselves together, got a job and worked hard, they would be okay. Their American dream would come true. And of course, we know this isn't true. Many people work very, very hard and they remain at a considerable socioeconomic disadvantage. But this thinking tends to inform much of, of our thought. So it's very obvious how religious these people were. And it was their religious attitudes that resulted in the attitudes towards evil and towards what I will explain as a dualistic worldview. And I'll unpack that for you in, uh, in a little more detail. So the Puritans felt that they were God's chosen people and that he would defend them against all evil. They also believed that because God had chosen them, the devil wanted their colony to fail and that God and the devil were locked in a supernatural battle to win their souls. So they were predisposed. They, they tended to believe that the devil was constantly working against them through his agents on the ground, his soldiers, which were witches. And this leads me to what a dualistic worldview is. So a dualistic worldview, duo means two, is that tendency to divide the world and everything in it into two extreme opposite halves. So they tended to see everything as either good or evil, of heaven or of the devil, of God or of Satan. Um, so as I said, either heavenly or hellish. And um, this meant that they, they didn't have any room in their thinking for shades of gray or much subtlety, which also predisposed them to believing the witchcraft accusations and the witchcraft trials. And much of the imagery in the Crucible illustrates this idea of a supernatural battle between the forces of God and the devil, heaven and hell, good and evil. And you'll see that Miller personifies the devil throughout the Crucible because the Puritans thought of the devil, they also called him Satan, Lucifer, the old boy, as being a supernatural person. 
today we tend to think of evil as being an abstract force, but they actually thought of the devil as being a real person with supernatural powers. They also believed that anyone who was not a separatist or at least a Christian must be on the devil's side. This was a product of their dualistic um, worldview. And so this made them very suspicious of the Native American Indians and it led to the persecution of the Native American Indians that followed. So most of the USA, as I said, was not colonized. Think of that map of the USA. Most of the USA was completely unknown to them. And they were actually quite paranoid. In Miller's words, they felt as though the American continent stretched endlessly west. And it was full of mystery for them. It stood dark and threatening over their shoulders night and day. So they lived with this constant sense of threat. So when the witchcraft trials happened, they probably thought, yeah, we knew this was coming. We'd always sensed that the devil was in the background. And this is a painting called Pilgrims Going to Church. So you can see how religious they were, but also how threatened they felt. You know, they go to church with their firearms in that harsh Massachusetts winter. So as I said, this, these two pictures uh, uh, sum up their attitudes towards evil, their dualistic worldview. You can see in the picture on the left that they literally thought of the devil as this leathery skinned person with horns on his head, big wings that personified all evil. And they thought of the earth as the supernatural battleground between the forces of good and evil. So in the painting on the right, you can see the good angel, which is the figure on the right, and the bad angel, which is the figure on the left, wrapped in flames, struggling for possession of a child. And that child symbolizes the innocent human soul. So the Puritans, as I said, wanted to practice a pure form of religion and rejected anything similar to the Roman Catholic Church, which is why they worshipped in what they called a meeting house rather than a church. And it was extremely simply furnished and, furn and services were led by a minister rather than a priest. And this explains why people like Proctor objected to Paris constantly wanting golden candlesticks and he says that he dreams more of cathedrals than clapboard meeting houses. Their paranoia about evil, according to Miller, also gave them a predilection for minding other people's business. Predilection, a liking for. For example, they even had a two-man patrol that would wander around the streets of Salem on a Sunday, checking that everyone was in the church service at the meeting house. And because they knew so much about the the doings and the business of every member of their community. When the witchcraft trials happened, it was really easy for them to find or make up evidence against people. So how did these attitudes towards evil affect them? Well, because their society was so strict, having a good reputation was all important. If you didn't have a good reputation, you had no place in the society. And if you had no places in the society, your chances of actually surviving were pretty slim. So this emphasis on a good reputation led to a huge amount of hypocrisy because when people made mistakes and everyone makes mistakes and moral mistakes are sin, um, they had no way to confess their sin and to get forgiveness. They simply had to hide their sin. They had to appear to be good Puritans at all times. And of course, one of the benefits of the trials Miller highlights, ironically, is that when they started, people actually had the opportunity to confess to all their darkest desires and bonus, they could blame others for their sinful thoughts. So according to Miller, the witch hunt trials uh, were actually a long overdue opportunity for everyone so inclined to express publicly his guilt and sins under the cover of accusations against the victims. It suddenly became possible and patriotic and holy for a man to say that Martha Corey had come into his bedroom at night and that while his wife was sleeping at his, at his side, Martha laid herself down on his chest and nearly suffocated him. And you can imagine this Puritan really enjoying imagining that scene and describing it because under normal circumstances such thoughts were strictly forbidden. Of course it was her spirit only but his satisfaction at confessing himself was no lighter than if it had been Martha herself. One could not ordinarily speak such things in public. 
Of course, that comes out of Miller's notes on Act One. So another thing that happened because of the purit of the of their attitude towards evil and the witchcraft trials was that the Puritans were able to express their hatred, which they couldn't do before. So Miller says, long-held hatreds of neighbors could now be openly expressed and vengeance taken despite the Bible's charitable inju injunctions. Landlust, which had been expressed before by constant bickering over boundaries and deeds, could now be elevated to the arena of morality. One could cry witch against one's neighbors and feel perfectly justified in the bargain. Old scores could be settled on the plane of heavenly combat between Lucifer and the Lord. See the reference to the dualistic worldview? Suspicions and the envy of the miserable towards the happy could and did burst out in the general revenge. <clears throat> so if you hated your neighbor or if they had something that you wanted, you could accuse them of witchcraft. And not only would you get away with this wicked thought and this wicked um, talk about your neighbor, you would actually be rewarded for it because you were being patriotic, you were being holy, you were cleansing Salem of witchcraft. And even though people like, for example, Thomas Putnam were motivated by pure greed for his neighbor's land, as I said, he was praised for accusing others of witchcraft, and then on top of it, he was able to buy their land when they were condemned for witchcraft. Other important things that inform what happened in the witchcraft trials was the Puritans' attitu attitudes towards children. And that can be pretty much summed up with um, the idea of they were to have no fun. So the people of Salem consistently underestimated children and their capacity for evil. And you'll see that this theme comes up again and again as I dis discuss each individual act. They tended to see and treat children as undeveloped adults, and they punished them for their crimes accordingly, punished them sometimes very, very harshly. So we know that if Abigail, for instance, had been found guilty of witchcraft, she would have been hanged. Miller says that the people of Salem never conceived that the children were anything but thankful for being permitted to walk straight, eyes slightly lowered, arms at the side, mouths shut until bidden to speak. So basically children were to be seen and not heard and if they stepped outside of the boundaries of uh, Puritan law and religion they were very harshly punished. In this picture on the right you can see that a woman has been punished for being a scold aka nagging a man by having a brace fitted over her head that would have had a sharp metal piece attached to it that actually pressed her tongue down and cut the inside of her mouth and she had to wear that in public for a certain number of hours or days so that not only was she punished with physical pain she was humiliated as well so you can see that these people had no tolerance for sin um, so woman as you can see from the picture, were largely treated as second-class citizens in a very, very patriarchal and chauvinistic society, and I'll explain those terms in a minute. They were expected to be modest and lead private lives and obey their husbands. So the way that women were treated wasn't very different from the way that children were treated. They were largely uneducated, and their role in life was to have children and be good wives and good mothers. Independence, and particularly any enjoyment of their sexuality, was frowned upon. And many men in their society were misogynists, and they accepted physical discipline of women. It might interest you to know that in England, and remember that their laws were based on English law, there was actually a law called the Rule of Thumb, which entitled a man to beat his wife with a stick, provided that it was not any thicker than their thumb and of course they had to do their beating before nine o'clock at night because it didn't do to disturb the neighbors with your wife screaming and you see this throughout the crucible whenever Proctor gets angry with a woman and he can't control them his go-to uh, solution is to pick up his horse crop and try and beat them into submission and obedience so other important uh, things to note about the Puritans, they would have dressed very conservatively, as you can see in that uh, painting. They covered everything up. Women were covered usually down to their wrists and their ankles. And if they were out in public, they would cover their head as well, usually with a little cap or with a scarf. Um, this is a scene at home, which is why the mother of the house actually has her head 
uncovered. And women were known as Goody plus their surname. So, for example, Goody Proctor, Goody Osborne, um, Goody Good, Goody Bishop. Okay, and Goody is simply an abbreviation of good woman. In other words, good Puritan woman. So, just to gloss a couple of terms. Chauvinism is an exaggerated support for one, for a person's own beliefs, society, or gender. Um, so, you can argue that the Puritans particularly the men, were chauvinistic. Misogyny is an unthinking prejudice against women or a contempt and dislike of women. Um, and you can argue that many of the male characters are misogynistic in The Crucible. But notice that women can also be misogynistic because women can also regard women in general and other women in particular as second class or basically sinful. A patriarchy is a social system or a government where most of the power is held by men and where women have little or no power. And this concept of who does and doesn't have power is fundamental to your understanding of the crucible and I will address it in more detail later on. Another important thing to think about is the Puritans' attitudes towards witches and witchcraft. And when we look at paintings depicting witchcraft today, we tend to see them as very weird and very odd and uh, depicting superstition. But you must remember that to the Puritans, these things were literally true. So they actually saw the devil as a half man, half goat figure with horns on his head. And uh, a witch or a wizard is defined as a person uh, usually a woman, who is believed to have evil magical powers. And notice that in the crucible, men can also be accused of being witches, although sometimes they're called wizards. Wizard is the more common um, name for a male witch. And this uh, painting depicts a witch's Sabbath by Francisco Goya. So you can see the witches gathered round the figure of Satan. Okay, this painting is also by Francisco Goya, and it depicts some of the things that witches were capable of. So, as far as the Puritans were, uh, uh, were concerned, witches could do all sorts of things that other people couldn't, because they had supernatural power from the devil. So, they would consort or socialize with the devil. They were able to fly, either with or without a broomstick. And of course, remember that in the 1600s, no one could fly, no person could fly, which is why flight was regarded as a supernatural power. They were able to cast spells and make bad things happen to other people. So, for example, they could inflict sickness on others. They could make their animals die. They could blight their crops. They were able to send their spirit out. In other words, they could actually send their spirit into another person so that their spirit took that person over and literally possessed or owned them and controlled their behavior. They believed that witches would sell their soul to the devil by signing a contract in his book using their own blood. And of course, they believed that witches would usually speak her heresy and believe in heresy. They would have beliefs or opinions that contradicted what was written in the church, written in the Bible or said by the Puritan church. And then finally, a major mark of witchcraft was the inability to tolerate or say words from the Bible um, and uh, things like psalms, hymns or prayers. Other beliefs in witchcraft, which you don't see so much in the Crucible, was that witches often lived alone and they had an animal that carried out their evil deeds, which they called their familiar, and that you could actually sometimes see physical signs of witchcraft on a witch. For example, they might have a mono brow or they might have moles in unusual places, particularly if their moles were on their chest. They regarded those as nipples that women would use to suckle the devil. They might have webs, extended webs between their fingers and toes. And any kind of physical uh, disability could be regarded as witchcraft. So someone with a squint or a lazy eye or a club foot or a stutter might be regarded as um, being possessed by the devil and showing signs of witchcraft. So this is a painting on the right called American Gothic, which depicts 
uh, typical Puritans. And you can see from this painting that they were quite often a very joyless people. So according to Miller, their beliefs forbade anything considered vain enjoyment. That included things like reading novels, going to the theater, dancing, or even celebrating Christmas. Hardly things that we would consider wildly immoral today. Miller believed that witchcraft was actually being committed in Salem. He says, I have no doubt that people were communing with and even worshiping the devil in Salem. And you want to consider why people might have done that. And I think part of the reason was because it was forbidden and therefore it was fun. Um, also, if you were powerless in Salem, what better way to gain power than by working with the devil? And note that the only characters in the play who definitely actually committed witchcraft were Abigail and Tichiba. Everyone else is accused of witchcraft but probably didn't commit it. So, um, also notice that they tended to link sexuality and particularly uncontained, unrestrained sexuality with evil and the devil. And this is why they were so horrified when uh, uh, people of Salem found out that Abigail and the girls had been dancing in the forest. Dancing was forbidden, therefore they must have been committing witchcraft. And when Paris thought he saw one of the girls naked, you know, that hints at uncontained sexuality. Therefore, they were probably committing witchcraft. And in fact, they believed that most of um, the communions with the devil were conducted by naked women. And according to Miller, sex, sin, and the devil were early linked. And so they continued to be in Salem. And then importantly, and are today. Our opposites are always robed in sexual sin, and it is from this unconscious conviction that demonology gains both its attractive sensuality and its capacity to infuriate and frighten. So think about how if we want to damage someone's reputation, particularly a woman's, but often what we will accuse them of is some form of sexual sin or what we would call deviance. And these come from Miller's notes again. So why did these girls accuse others of witchcraft? And the motives for the witchcraft accusation are really, really important. So pay careful attention here because they come up again and again and again in the play. And it's a, a hot favorite essay topic as well. So one of the possibilities is that these girls were living in fear and that led to a mob mentality. In other words, they did whatever the crowd was doing, which led to hysteria or mass hysteria. Mass hysteria is when everyone in a group starts experiencing the same psychological or physical symptoms. And um, that happens simply because they believe that they're all being afflicted or, or affected in the same way, usually by supernatural force. They were obsessed with the fate of their souls and they had a total belief in the existence of witches. And so their only defense against witchcraft and witchcraft accusations was to accuse others. And of course, making accusations, as I already said, allowed them to act out forbidden desires. So for example, their envy, their lust, their desire for revenge, which is vengeance. And then very importantly, making witchcraft accusations was a power trip. These are children in a chauvinistic, misogynistic, patriarchal society. And until the witchcraft trials happened, they had very little power. With the witchcraft trials, they gained an enormous amount of power. And they really seemed to enjoy using and abusing that power. And of course, once they had started accusing people, they couldn't stop because if they did, they might be accused of making false accusations and they might lose their power and then be hanged as witches. So here you can see a scene from the crucible where one of the girls is claiming that witchcraft is happening and that, that she is being possessed. So now we move on to the structure of the play. It's important to realize that the play is structured in four acts. And throughout my discussions, I've symbolized each act with a particular picture. And those pictures are linked to what each act actually deals with. So act one, which I symbolize with a picture of a witch on a broomstick, 
revolves around the accusations of witchcraft and the motive and the motives for the accusations of witchcraft. So in Act One, Abigail and her friends are suspected of witchcraft. Betty Paris and Ruth Putnam seem to be possessed. Abigail's reputation is questioned, and the importance of reputation in Salem is firmly established. The motives for the witchcraft allegations are established. As I said, these included greed, fear, the desire for self-defense, vengeance, and envy. Hale arrives, and he's full of faith and confidence that he can reliably tell that there's witchcraft in Salem and who is and isn't a witch. So at this stage of the play, he's still thinking like a typical Puritan. He has that dualistic worldview. And the girl's power increases from nothing at the start of the act to being considerable when they accuse others of witchcraft towards the end of the act. And of course, we see that Abigail has a massive influence of, on Proctor, who still has strong romantic feelings for her. Act two um, is symbolized by this... Uh, skull with an arrow through it and it's because act two revolves around Proctor's relationship with Abigail and Proctor's relationship with Elizabeth and uh, the events in act two happen about a week after act one and it starts with Proctor and Elizabeth arguing about Abigail's power over Proctor and Proctor's feelings for Abigail and and Elizabeth actually says that Abigail has an arrow in Proctor with a reference to that arrow being Cupid's love arrow, which is why I've shown the skull with the arrow through it. And of course, it's that deadly love of Proctor that leads to the witchcraft accusations, which is why I've used a skull. Mary Warren gains power over the Proctors. She tells them that Elizabeth is suspected. Hale arrives to question the Proctors, and we see the first signs of his doubt in the court and also in that dualistic way of thinking. We hear that Rebecca Nurse and Martha Corey have been arrested. The poppet plot is revealed, and because of the poppet plot and Abigail's manipulations, Elizabeth gets arrested. And because of Elizabeth's arrest, Abigail gains power over the Proctors in a legal sense, and she gains absolute power over Salem, but Proctor loses all love and respect for her, so she starts losing her emotional power over Proctor. Act three is symbolized by a crucible, okay? And remember that a crucible is a vessel used to melt down metal in order to remove impurities. And in many ways, Salem, the witchcraft trials, and the court acts as a crucible because people are placed under enormous psychological pr uh, pressure and we start to see who is morally pure and morally impure. So the events in Act 3 happen about 40 days after Act 2. The courts and Abigail and the girls are at the height of their power. Evil, lies and a good reputation start triumphing over good honesty and genuine integrity. Proctor confesses to adultery with Abigail because he wants to discredit her as a witness. And Elizabeth lies for the first time in her life, saying that Proctor was faithfully. And ironically, she lies out of love to protect Proctor's reputation. But because of her lie, Danforth and the court choose to ignore all evidence that Abigail and the, the girls are dishonest. And Mary Warren then switches from testifying against Abigail and the girls, and she testifies against Proctor. And as a result of Mary Warren's testimony and Elizabeth's lie, Proctor gets arrested and charged with witchcraft. Proctor realizes his love for Elizabeth and his absolute hatred of Abigail. She loses the last vestiges of her emotional power over him. And Hale loses the last vestiges of his faith in the trials, his faith in a dualistic way of thinking, and he denounces the court. Act 4 I've symbolized with an image of love and an image of the gallows and hanging or death. And Act 4, I've, I've used these symbols for Act 4 because Act 4 is really about a battle between love and hatred, between life and death between good and evil, and Act 4 determines which of those two sides of the supernatural battle actually wins. So remember that the events in Act 4 ha happen only four to six months after Act 1, which illustrates how very quickly the witchcraft trials had spun out of control. Salem is in complete chaos. Abigail actually runs away, and um, 
but the court still remain powerful and decide to proceed with hanging those people that they've accused unjustly, despite the fact that their star witness has been proved to be dishonest and probably lying throughout in absolutely categorical terms. Elizabeth and John Proctor finally reconcile. Hale finally loses all his faith in his religious faith and in the courts to the point that he actually tries to get the accused to lie and confess to witchcraft so that they can save their lives rather than refusing to lie and saving their souls. Proctor decides that he's going to hang rather than give a false confession and damage his friends' reputations. And in the process, he regains his integrity, but he loses his life. And as I said, this act is the final battle between good and evil and love and death. And the question you want to ask yourself by the end of the act is, do evil and death and the forces of hell and Abigail and the court actually win? And I think Miller answers those questions in his Echoes Down the Corridor, which is a what he writes at the end of the play, where he gives a brief description of events after the hanging of Rebecca Nurse, John Proctor, and the other innocents. So ask yourself this question as you read through those echoes down the corridor. In the echoes, Miller says that Paris was voted out of his ministry. He was left and never seen again. Abigail was rumored to have become a prostitute in the Massachusetts city of Boston. And 20 years after the executions, living victims and families of the dead were given financial compensation. Some of the people that benefited weren't actually victims, uh, ironically, but had actually been accusers in the original trials. And now they were being compensated because they had suffered. Um, the excommunications of everyone who was rejected by the Puritan church before they were hanged were actually reversed in 1712, so technically they could now go to heaven. Elizabeth Proctor would, uh, got married four years after Proctor's death. Um, he comments that many of the victims' farms were derelict and unoccupied more than a hundred years after those victims had died because no one wanted to buy them or live on them. They had, a super, they had a superstitious belief that there was still evil on those farms. Importantly, the power of the courts were effectively broken by the witchcraft trials and Salem was effectively no longer a theocracy because after the hanging of Rebecca Nurse and John Proctor and others, the people of Salem rose up and they rejected the trials and they threw the court out of the village. So you need to decide, do evil and death actually win? And I don't think there's a definite answer here, so I'm not going to give you a definite answer. I think you can argue it either way. You can also summarize the plot in some important quotes, and I think these quotes basically encapsulate on, and are at the heart of what happens in each act. So in Act 1, Abigail says to the girls, I will come to you in the black of some terrible night and will bring you a pointy reckoning that will shudder you. So here she is alluding to witchcraft and the power of witchcraft and also her ability to have revenge. In Act 2, Elizabeth says to Proctor, You'll tear it free when you come to know that I will be your only wife or no wife at all. She has an arrow in you yet, John Proctor, and you know it well. And of course, that arrow is Abigail's deadly love arrow that she's firmly embedded in Proctor in Act 1. In Act 3, Danforth says to Proctor and Mary Warren, We burn a hot fire here. It melts down all concealment, which of course alludes to the imagery of the crucible and of course the title of the play. In Act 4, Proctor says to Hale and Danforth, You have made your magic now, for now I do see, for now I do think I see some shred of goodness in John Proctor. So here you can see that battle between heaven and hell, good and evil. God and the devil. So before we get into the characters in our next session, I just want to make a comment on Miller's um, uh, tendency or interest in historical accuracy. Miller says, this play is not a history in the sense in which the word is used by the academic historian. Dramatic purposes have sometimes required many characters to be fused into one. The number of girls involved in the crying out has been reduced. Abigail's age has been raised. While there were several judges of almost equal authority, I have symbolized them all in Hathorne and Danforth. However, 
I believe that the reader will discover here the essential nature of one of the strangest and most awful chapters in human history. The fate of each character is exactly that of his historical model, and there is no one in the drama who did not play a similar, and in some cases exactly the same, role in history. So as you read, if you're thinking this is far-fetched, this could never have happened, please remember it did. And he goes on to say, as for the characters of the persons, little is known about most of them except what may be surmised by a few letters, the trial record, certain broadsides written at the time, and references to their conduct in sources of varying reliability. They may therefore be taken as creations of my own, drawn to the best of my ability in conformity with their known behavior, except as in indicated in the commentary I've written for this text. And that comes out of Miller's note on the historical accuracy of the play, which you can see in a book called Introduction. Um, it's called the, the Crucible, a play in four acts, introduction by Christopher Bigsby. So one of the things you want to consider as you're reading this play is how Miller comments on power in the society and how it varies. Think about how gender, age, race, religious belief, wealth and land ownership and ancestry either gave or removed power to char from characters. And at various stages in the play, think about where the various characters like Tituba, Abigail and Reverend Paris would sit in this power hierarchy. Where would you situate them if you think about people having the least power being on the bottom and those with the most power being on top? And I will discuss this in more detail. Remember that reputation, as I said, is the currency of power in Salem. So witchcraft accusations, ironically, rather than witchcraft itself, were the ultimate source of power in Salem. And accusations of witchcraft can be seen as the ultimate way to gain power. Once a person was accused, their reputation and therefore their ability to function in Salem was actually destroyed, unless they could transfer the blame to someone else and gain power in the process. Look out for this process as you read through the play. So a person's power in Salem depended on their reputation, which was also called their good name, and later their ability to accuse others of witchcraft. And as the play develops, you will see that a good reputation usually comes at the expense of personal integrity. As I said, as the witchcraft trials developed, Salem became like a crucible. Crucibles were vessels that could withstand very high temperatures and therefore they were used as containers to melt or smelt down metal. And metals such as gold were usually melted in crucibles to remove impurities. So think about how the psychological pressure of the witchcraft trials actually separated Salem society into those with integrity and those who refused to name others or make false confessions. And, of course, there were those that had no integrity and happily accused others to save themselves and to gain power. So the trials, as I said, operated like a heated crucible, separating the pure from the impure. So things to think about before our next session. If you had lived in a Puritan community in Salem in the late 1600s, how would this have affected your behavior and worldview? Who does not have power in our society today? How can people gain power by using morally acceptable means? And very importantly, how do people gain power in our society in an immoral way? And I will pick up on this theme of power and discuss it further in terms of the characters in our next session. Thank you.